Hello, my name is Marcus. I'm the compiler of a collection of therapy quotes entitled 1001 Windmills of the Mind. This is TQ 1265 to 1270. But uh, I'm kind of stuck actually on a TQ 1245. And yesterday as well, I tried to do a follow up on it. So I want to continue in my efforts to try to find some clarity, clarity around this quote. Um, so just by the way, 1001 Windmills of the Mind, um, the core collection of quotes runs from TQ1, therapy quote number one, up to 1001. And there are roughly 25 themes or threads or topics that run throughout the series. Um, every major defense mechanism is covered. Uh, emotional eating is covered, um, Margaret Mahler's theory about the psychological birth. She says that the psychological birth doesn't automatically take place with the biological birth and that there's this uh, process that she calls the separation individuation process uh, from birth to roughly around the age of three. Symbiosis, practicing, rapprochement, whole object relations, and then the psychological birth, meaning the child's life force uh, was originally affected to the frightening image of the mother. Then with whole object relations, the child's life force is attached to the whole representation of the mother. And with that safety, the child's life force can deconfect from the image of the mother and connect or cafect uh, to the whole self-representation. So that's called getting the key out from under mother's pillow, and that's the psychological birth. So that expression, getting the key out from under mother's pillow, that comes from Robert Bly in his discussion of the fairy tale uh, covered in the book Iron John. Uh, that's, that's a metaphor uh, of uh, achieving the psychological birth. So man's main task is to give psychological birth to himself if he didn't get it naturally by the age of three with a secure attachment style. Right? Um, so uh, overall these quotes are trying to address uh, the transition around any kind of relational trauma, developmental trauma, uh, any kind of um, area where we're kind of stuck and to try to face that, understand it, uh, give witnessing to it. Grief is healed when it's witnessed by a caring other, so we're sort of trying to be our own caring witness to understand it. Um, so uh, another thread is uh, William Fairbairn's model of the endopsychic structure, this internal theater, this, this map or this inner universe. Um, so that, that was covered uh, throughout the series. Um, so we, we live in two worlds, uh, this internal object relations world based on our memories from childhood. And if there's a lot of frightening memories, uh, then our unconscious ego is going to project some of these memories into the present. Right? Um, so the idea is to uh, heal our childhoods, uh, to make it harmonious in the internal object relations world. Then we can enjoy the present and, and see the present realistically. If we're projecting too many of our frightening memories into the present, that means we're distorting the present. We're not seeing the present realistically. We're seeing it through the lens of our past pain. Um, so um, so pr projection is a major threat in this series. Projection is the vehicle to make the unconscious conscious. Projection is how our psyche is trying to make us conscious. Uh, because if we're unconscious, then we're going to project it. So the purpose of projected, projection is to make us conscious. So the healing journey is, to, as we all know, to make the unconscious conscious. Okay, so uh, Margaret Mahler, uh, William Fairbairn, Melanie Klein, she has a theory about the positions, a very important concept. She talks a lot about splitting and projective identification. Now Masterson brings their work together, called the Masterson Approach. That's the fourth mentor. Karen Horney, her work, and Edmund Bergler, his work. So those are the six mentors in this series, and Robert Bly makes an occasional sort of guest appearance here. Um, we've been using Robert Bly, Robert Bly's metaphor of the, the unconscious self. When we say know thyself, know the conscious self, and know the unconscious self, his metaphor is that we all drag this bag behind us uh, called uh, 
the stranger within, or the secret self, or the shadow soul, or the shadow self, or uh, it's the one who walks with us, who's not like us, but who is us, or someone's living my life and I know nothing about him. Uh, one person calls it the skeleton, he's a wise teacher, uh, and you want to give the skeleton the best seat at the fireplace, and regard him as uh, having a right to be, and he's a wise teacher teaching you that there is a conquest of the self, that the psychological birth can be achieved. So he is this uh, teacher. Um, in mythology, it's Poseidon, right? Um, the unconscious, uh, the ocean is the unconscious. All the energy in that bag we drag behind. So Robert Bly says, by the age of five, so much of who we are gets put into this bag, and we spend the rest of our lives trying to re-own, reintegrate what we disowned in childhood. That's the hero's journey to be own what we don't know about ourselves. Um, all that energy in the bag is sometimes called the id. That's what that phrase means. It just means all the energy in the bag. But that's all it means. Um, so, uh, and uh, also we use object relations theory as the overall sort of guiding theory throughout the series, mainly by Masterson and Fairbairn. Um, so, it's a combination of all six authors plus Robert Bly. Um, so I guess if I had to put some kind of a label to it, it would be the the Karen Horninian, Edmund Burglarian, Masters James Mastersonian, Fairbairnian, Kleinian, Margaret Mollerian approach. <laughs> Uh, there's a, we covered quite a bit of ground. I think it's a, it's a good uh, project uh, in the sense of uh, that uh, a lot of this material hasn't really been presented. Um, hold on a sec. So if we're lucky, we'll see the Canada geese or the heron, possibly the seal. So by the way, 1001 Windmills of the Mind is only, to the best of my knowledge, is only the second collection of quotes from the psychoanalytic perspective. The first was done in 1990 by Gregory Bauer in his book, Wit and Wisdom in Psychodynamic Psychotherapy. That's a great book. Uh, but that was done in 1990. 1001 Windmills of the Mind is a sort of a continuation of that. And uh, many, of, most of the quotes are most, 1990, um, and I'd like to think that we've covered, uh, that there are more topics covered, um, and that there are movie quotes in here, and uh, uh, you know, quotes from TV shows, and so th I tried to lighten it up sometimes. So one of the threads throughout this series is... Um, um, the topic of uh, prejudice, um, and all along I've just been saying how uh, uh, I've adopted the idea that uh, when there's repression, then there, that's a form of splitting, that's psychic pain, then we project. So usually we either project our unloved self onto others, and then do to others what was done to us to communicate what was done to us. So the, bi so the baby interprets not receiving enough love as being rejected, that's too painful. So he might identify with the aggressor, deny his despised self or the hungry, enraged, empty part self, and then in his unconscious fantasy, see others in, in a weak, weaker position, or he needs to see them in a weaker position, so he'll put them down uh, in his, it's called the devaluing narcissistic pattern, put down humor, sarcastic humor, the sardonic humor, trying to see others in a weaker position, because the baby felt in that weaker position, maybe identified with the aggressor, and thus to others what his mother did to him. Now, burglar calls that a negative magic gesture. When a person is putting others down, they're trying to communicate that they felt put down by their mother. See, so it's a communication. So the theory is, when there's a trauma, a relational trauma like that, the person tries to relive it, recreate it, uh, try to redo it to see if he can master it or get a better outcome. It's 
a secondary delusion, it can't be done. Um, so uh, the idea is to, to mourn the loss of not getting enough love, uh, not to still try to get it in the rebellion against the mother. Because what the person, what burglar says, they're trying to show up the mother. He's, so the person, so the, de the person with the, using the devaluing narcissistic pattern, who's constantly putting others down, um, they're trying to, burglar says, they're trying to show up the mother. See what mother uh, did to me? This is, what I'm, this is what I'm doing to others? This is what mother did to me. So he's in rebellion against the mother. See, he's not even trying to get his mother's love. He's just trying to show and, and express his anger towards his mother through displacement, through projection. Right? So it's a secondary delusion. No non-threatening substitute other is that mother. They can't make up for that. But they can't. This other innocent person can't take the projector in a time travel machine, zoom back to the babyhood nursery situation, be that good breast, be that, be that good mother and provide the nurturing that was needed. Can't be done. That's what the person is sort of positive intention of his acting out is to communicate. But he's unaware of it. Um, now sometimes the person, so so this kind of, uh, that, that prejudice can come from that. Another form is that uh, the person accepts that he's the unloved child, sees others as the devaluing mother, and now in pseudo-assertion or pseudo-aggression, they're going to be angry at their mother. So they're going to project the frightening image of the mother onto non threatening substitute others and say that they're so terrible. Again, to communicate that their mother that they felt that their mother was being terrible by not giving them enough love. Again, we're not blaming the mother. She, she may have been caught in her existential dilemma. She may have had prenatal distress syndrome, birth trauma, perinatal trauma, intergenerational trauma, trauma, trauma in the environment, situational trauma, school shock. Uh, there could have been trauma at the dentist's office, trauma while getting their tonsils out, a forced relocation. So the, the, the mother or the father, they may be caught in the existential net see so we're not blaming them um, so uh, so one of the threads is intergenerational trauma if the mother didn't get a secure attachment style she doesn't have it in her to give her ch to her children if she's not aware of it she'll just repeat it so burglar would say see child I can't give you a, a secure attachment style she's projecting the mother onto the child saying look uh, Look, mother in my mind, look what I'm doing to your grandchild. That's what you did to me. Things like that. So yeah, so that, that's that's worth the collection in of itself. This thread on intergenerational trauma, I would think. The thread on prejudice. Uh, the thread on the psychoanalysis of religion. That's a, that's a good topic. Interesting topic. Um, the thread on uh, the, our mentors. The six threads on the work of our mentors. Thread on Robert Bly's work. We've got a thread on emotional eating. Uh, the thread on Loretta Brunning's work, dopamine and serotonin. So there are a lot of interesting threads throughout this series. Um, now, a couple of weeks ago, a, a quote came along that said, "If you think prejudice is just uh, about projection, either uh, you know projecting the frightening image of the devalu of the unloving mother onto others, and then being." And think so terribly about others that way or doing to others what was done to you to communicate what was done to you you're being one-sided he says you have to look at sociological factors so in the bonus material uh, so all of the quotes beyond uh, 1001 are the bonus quotes so in the bonus quotes which we're now in uh, we're we're building on those threads and we're adding a few new threads so in the bonus quotes uh, that quote came along where he said you're being too one-sided you have to look at the sociological factors so we've added a new thread on the sociological factors of prejudice and uh, so I won't redo that there so may I refer you to uh, earlier videos on the, the sociological side of that contributes to prejudice for example if mothers are being coached in magazines to use the bottle and the schedule that's going to traumatize the baby uh, he'll think the mother is being rejecting. Oh, just some uh, little little baby birds here. Okay. <laughs> so no sign of the Canada geese yet. 
so far I only saw them once. They were honking along. And it was quite a quite a sound. Um, yeah. So um, the baby interprets that as his that his needs didn't get met. The Jocasta style of mothering, that's a huge thread in this series. That's, that alone is worth a collection, I would think. The whole thread on the Jocasta style of mothering. So uh, the foundation of that is the self-help quote. Mothers are there to meet the needs of the child, not the other way around. If it is the other way around, that's called the Jocasta style of mothering. Right? So the basic idea is that uh, if the mother didn't get her, if the woman didn't get her needs met when she was a child, because her mother was using the Jocasta style of mothering and then she developed a fusion with the mother and she can't separate from the mother. That's now her having the, the electric complex. Uh, then she's going to, when she has her child, uh, she's, she might unconsciously say, finally, someone's gonna be considerate to me and, and, and listen to me and, and uh, respond to me and respect me. So the mother is parentifying uh, the child turning the child into a parent. That's called the Jocasta style of mothering. Uh, and then the child, if it's a daughter, she ends up with the electric complex. If it's the boy, she, he ends up with a mother complex or the Don Juan syndrome or the Peter Gintz, Peter Pan, the play, right? And um, in the comic book series, Psychoanalysis, there's a character there called Mark Stone. He talks about that. Uh, the, the threat on Peter Gint, by Karen Horney. That's uh, another thread in this series. That would be a, that would be another good reason to get this series, just to learn about the Pierre Gint story. Um, so um, yeah, so uh, that magazine said you know uh, taught mothers to use the bottle and the schedule. Now that's going to traumatize the baby because the baby says he's hungry. The mother says no, you're not. Uh, you have to follow the schedule. So the so the, baby, so the the real self of the child goes into exile. See, uh, so, he's, so that can lead to it. So a sociological influence can lead to prejudice because if the child has to repress his real feelings, that's splitting. Splitting leads to projection. Projection leads to prejudice, right? And then it's covered over with, with all of these rationalizations and further rationalizations. So, so prejudice can come from. Uh, can be sort of encouraged by the sociological factors like like that magazine um, we had this and that quote from two weeks ago he said if um, if, the, if the economic system is one of global pillage and not global village then he said you're gonna need uh, poverty to pillage so how do you create poverty he said poverty is man-made well you got to create prejudiced people so you you uh, co-opt uh, spiritual rituals uh, and invent and convert it into religion he said and you give them creeds and dogma which promote repression which promotes splitting which promotes the prejudiced personality so uh, we had a so I'll refer you to videos during the last uh, week and a half so we covered the psychology of religion I won't go over it again here so that's a sociological factor uh, that can lead to religion is a sociological factor that can contribute to the prejudice of personality because religion is a tool of the pillage system. See. Um, and um, now another sort of sociological factor that I thought maybe contributed to the prejudice. So again, we're building on the theme of prejudice, right? Why is there prejudice? Uh, prejudice means um, someone thinks that uh, they're okay and others are not okay. Or they might think, I'm not okay and others are okay. Or they might think, I'm not okay and others are not okay. Healthy development is, I'm okay, you're okay. That's mutuality, whole object relations, the psychological birth is, I'm okay, you're okay. Now, that's the tolerant personality. To create the prejudiced personality, you need one of those other three mindsets. Right. Now, another thread in this series is Fairbairn's theory of the moral defense. He says that in the beginning, all babies think that they're not okay and the mother's okay. Because the baby has to bond to the mother. The mother's the giantess in the nursery. 
this grand, omnipotent, all-powerful being, and sometimes she's frustrating, but the child, to preserve his attachment, he'll just uh, take it upon himself to say, oh, okay, well, mother must be all good. To make her all good, he has to make himself bad. So that's the, I'm not okay, you're okay. Now this gets sorted out by the age of three, and he, oh, and mother, the child thinks, oh no, I, I get it now, I'm okay, mother's okay, sometimes she's frustrating, that's okay. That's whole object relations. Uh, so in other words, all children start off with, um, I'm not okay, uh, you're okay. Um, now, if there's severe trauma before the age of 15 months, child identifies with the aggressor and he thinks since the mother was okay he wasn't okay now he thinks he's the mother and he's fused with the mother he now thinks that he's okay and others are not okay meaning he's not okay but he projects his wound his unloved self onto others and says others are not okay to communicate that you see so that's the I'm okay you're not okay and that's the trauma of the identification with the aggressor that's more severe trauma to think that to think that you're okay and others are not okay that's the much more severe trauma. Uh, the codependent pattern, so uh, if the arrested development takes place before the age of 15 months, that can end up with identification with the aggressor. That's the narcissistic pattern, the hostile provocative attachment style. They didn't get their symbiotic needs met, so they're trying to confuse with someone else to get their extra uterine needs met. It can't be done, but that's why they're aggressive. Some of the schizoid patterns are like that. Uh, some of the other ones. So that's a more uh, hard, the main emotions are hate, greed, envy, or grenvy, spite, vindictiveness, schadenfreude. So they're stuck in rebellion with the mother, either uh, by being her and doing to others to show her up, or by still trying to, um, or, or just uh, in the closet version of that, they uh, watch others do that, and then they vicariously get their, they preserve their grandiosity that way, through others. Now let's say the child did get enough love up to the age of 15 months, and then he's, he's able to differentiate, to hatch out of that symbiotic egg further. So Mahler says that um, in the extended womb there's like another egg, and in the psychological birth, the differentiation process, the hatching out of that fusion, uh, that fusional egg, is gradual from three months to 36 months. Now, at 15 months, it's a little more it's a little more clear. Um, so, if the trauma takes place between 15 months and 36 months, the theory is the child still maintains that I'm not okay and others are okay. That's the codependent pattern. So, the codependent pattern they're still traumatized, and so they're the give they're, they overly give of themselves and. You know, they're sort of like the pleasers and all, they move towards people, they're overly hopeful. Um, so one self-help author calls them the clingers, and the earlier one, the stingers. She calls them the, the clingers and the stingers. Um, as a metaphor for the, the common relationship pattern, when a person with a narcissistic pattern, they want to marry a person with a codependent pattern because they know that the person with the codependent pattern uses what's called the sweet lemons rationalization. The person with the codependent pattern is trying to master the trauma of having a narcissistic pattern, and they always see others as good, and they want to heal the other, they want to save the other, they want to fix, repair the other, you see. Now the person with the narcissistic pattern, all they want to do is put the other one down, preserve their identity, which is identification with the aggressor, you see. So the co person with the codependent pattern is constantly trying to save and be, be wonderful to the person with the narcissistic pattern, and they love all that, it, they love that opportunity, they, they love that opportunity, and the person with the codependent pattern, they're in a secondary delusion, thinking they're going to save this one, this person, and get the love that they need, but they're not. So finally that wears out. So they both have an insecure attachment style, that one there. So, so the codependent pattern is using the, the, I'm not okay, you're okay. The narcissistic pattern, this hostile provocative one and others, they're using I'm okay and others are not okay. Now some of the schizoid ones, they say uh, I'm, not okay, I'm not okay and others are not okay. okay. Um, so one author, one, this TQ1245, she came along and asked the question, 
when did this begin? When did this natural phenomena of children getting a secure attachment style, when did that stop? When did that happen? What happened? Her theory is that for, uh, for 200,000 years, roughly, before agricultural, uh, before agricultural settled societies, roughly 15,000 years ago, her theory is, according to her, every child got a secure attachment style and ended up with the I'm okay, you're okay. And then groups before agriculture, uh, they were peaceful. Uh, they, they didn't rebel with each other. She said there might have been squabbles over mating situations, but there wasn't, they didn't have, you know, groups quarreling with other groups because they were all nomadic and and every child had a secure attachment style because when the baby came out, the baby was uh, strapped around the mother's front. So he got his extra uterine, his extended womb's needs met. See. Now, 15,000 years ago, farming was discovered. Then we settled down. And she says that that changed things. And I didn't understand. Here, here's where I'm stuck. Here's where I need help. Why did that change? If we take her assumption that all along, every baby got a secure attachment style and ended up with the I'm okay, you're okay, and there's tolerant personality. And she said that prior to agricultural, the average per everybody basically had an adult personality. Generous, calm, content, humble, kind, autonomous, communal, friendly, relaxed. They had that kind of natural self. There wasn't these ideas of everyone was, all babies were loved, so there was no hate and fighting and those kinds of things. There's no such thing as schadenfreude. Possible. even right that's her theory but then when agricultural started something changed so I'm trying to understand if we take that premise if we take her premise just for the sake of argument how can we understand it so I came across uh, so I mentioned before the work of Loretta Brunning is uh, one of the threads in this series so I thought I'd revisit two of her quotes one on dopamine and one on um, serotonin. So let, let's do the dopamine one here. So dopamine for the chase, serotonin from the catch. Dopamine is that you feel excited, you, f you feel this expectation that when you get a reward, when you get something, you're gonna feel safe and you calm down. So okay, just roughly, briefly again, from the mammalian brain's point of view, so we're talking about the, the limbic system, the old brain. From that uh, monkey brain, let's say. From that point of view, status means safety. So when the monkey gets some kind of status or when they get some kind of reward or something that makes them feel safe, uh, the brain sends the person, the organism, serotonin. So the person is looking for the status to get the, um, the feeling of I'm safe. Now the pursuit of getting that status, whatever it is, that's the dopamine. Because you're hopeful in the chase of getting it, it's exciting, so that's dopamine. So dopamine for the chase, serotonin from the catch. So um, the speculation is, when farming was discovered, that was a huge catch. Now the, now the brain got a lot of serotonin. Now when there's, now the brain habituates, so the, you see, now the person is, used to getting that level of serotonin from the agriculture. Now if they don't get that, or if there's a threat of it, they're going to be stressed out. Now maybe that's when the insecure attachment style began, to, to deal with that stress so, uh, of, not, of not getting that level of serotonin that they're accustomed to. Again, people roamed around uh, nomadic uh, groups of, uh, she said, between 5 and 25, she said on average. They just ate berries and uh, I guess they hunted or whatever, or fished, uh, but they were peaceful. And this went on peacefully for 150,000, 200,000, or a million years, whatever it was. And then suddenly, agricultural agriculture got discovered. They settled down, they got this huge boost, an overstimulation, let's say. Let's just call that an overstimulation, an unexpected, way overstimulation of, um, of serotonin. So the brain the neural network uh, now the brain is wired for that and expects that now if the person 
Now if there's a threat to their farming and their crops, the weather changes or something and the crops, now they're stressed out. Now with the stress, maybe the children are going to be stressed and they, and they have to cope with that stress. So then they develop one of the three unnatural mindsets. So I'm thinking maybe there's something like that going on. So again, let's look at the dopamine once more. Okay, dopamine. The motivating power of dopamine was suddenly clear to me when I stumbled upon the spinach study. Monkeys were trained to do a task in exchange for a spinach leaf and then offered juice instead of spinach. The monkeys' dopamine soared. Juice is a huge reward to the nonverbal brain, okay, the pre okay, the, the the mammalian brain, right? Because sugar meets caloric needs much more than spinach. It's much more quicker, right? But after four days of juice, the dopamine stopped. It had already done its job. You see? The dopamine is for the chase. It got it, it did its job, so it got the, the juice, right? I saw how dopamine motivates us to keep looking for better ways to meet the needs. So dopamine for the chase, in other words. That's what dopamine is for. Okay, now it got it got the juice. So that's now a set. That's the given now, right? So juice is now in the brain. I mean, I mean the, the idea of juice and, and the reward from juice is now uh, sort of settled in, in the mind, right? In the brain. Okay, and I saw how expectations get wired by experience, so a reward is soon taken for granted. Yeah, it is taken for granted. You see, so she's saying here, dopamine, so the monkey was happy with the spinach, everything's fine with the spinach. Suddenly it got this, this concentration of juice. Now again, juice is like a, it's a concentration, it's not the whole fruit, right? You extract the liquid and you took away the pulp. So there's like a concentration of sugar there. So th that's a sudden boost um, in, in, uh, in, in feeling safe because you got your calorie needs met. So the dopamine um, was there to, to get the spinach leaf. Then he got the spinach leaf, he got a little amount of serotonin, and that's okay. And that, that was sort of the natural state of affairs. Right? Because it's a whole food, it's natural. Darwin says we're part of nature, we're, we're natural that way, right? But then something unnatural happened. We created juice, um, a concentrate, in other words. Uh, someone said if you concentrate something out of something and you distill it and concentrate it and distill it again and again, it becomes like a drug almost. It has almost like you're moving towards it being like a drug like effect. So like an over concentration of, um, um, you know, the, if you just, if you take the juice and then remove the water and just keep the sugar, do it again and again, and it becomes very concentrated, you see. So now the brain responds to this huge reward of juice, this, this concentration of sugar. Now, okay, expectations get wired by experience. So now the, the expectations get wired. So now, now it's set there. Now let's think about Let's think about the nomadic tribes. They found agriculture. Maybe that, that's like the juice. The, the farming, the settling down, having crops and all that, that's like the juice. They got this huge boost. Now its expectations are there. Okay, now, but there's more. But there's more. The researchers switched back to spinach instead of juice. The monkeys went into a rage and flew the spinach back at the white lab coats. <laughs> so you can imagine the spinach, uh, the monkeys throwing the, the spinach. Because it's stress. The, they expected the juice. The, the brain got wired for juice. It expected it. When it didn't get the juice, there was stress. Okay, now let's go to the farming. Now, let's say we have the farms. Let's say there's a weather issue. Uh, uh, then there's stress. Now, from the stress, the mothers might not be able to offer a secure attachment style. 
and those children end up with a developmental trauma. You see? And then when they have a developmental trauma, they pass it on to their kids. And maybe that's the birth of uh, prejudice, because an insecure attachment style is going to lead to prejudice, if it's the narcissistic pattern. Yeah. So the insecure attachment style, there are a variety of forms. There's the narcissistic pattern, the hostile provocative one. The codependent pattern, they have an insecure attachment style, but they, they see everything as being too good all the time. So they're not really, their prejudice is kind of harmless, I guess. But uh, they have like reverse prejudice. They, 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 they idealize everything too much, right? So, um, so let's let's follow up. Um, so let, let's do that quote. Uh, let's go back to the quote TQ twelve forty five. Hold on, hold on a sec here. So here's the quote that started this uh, confusing uh, this uh, confusing confusing discussion. Okay. So this was from a couple of days ago. Adult society. Okay. So as opposed to sibling society. So Robert Bly has a book called Sibling Society. We're all school. Sibling rivalry and all the. Why? Okay. So, but long ago it was all adult society, right? So adult society. Okay. Prior, so there was this adult society prior to the emergence of agricultural settled societies. Societies. They live in highly cooperative but fluid groupings with deep values of egalitarianism and sharing. This could be seen all over the world, in any continent, in any hemisphere. People were generous, calm, content, humble, kind, highly autonomous, and highly communal. Okay, agricultural comes along. Okay, so here's the quote here. So here's what I'm getting at. Now, if agricultural comes along and they're stressed out, and that skews the child-rearing methods, okay, Species atypical child raising. Okay, so now here's the birth with the agricultural. Maybe this is when how we raise children got changed. Okay, species atypical child raising seeds underdeveloped and even skewed human nature and morality. The resulting misdeveloped adults create societies that perpetuate the undercare of children, fostering communities of people with neurobiologically framed paranoiac, paranoiac perceptions. Okay, so the hostile provocative attachment style, the narcissistic pattern. Okay, so they've identified with the aggressor. Uh, or they project the frightening mother onto others. So that's the paranoid schizoid position from Melanie Klein. So, um, and when there's a developmental trauma, there's repetition compulsion to try to master that trauma, so that leads to intergenerational trauma. Now, those farms, okay, uh, to deal with the stress of not losing, to avoid the feeling of stress if there's a weather problem, the farms got bigger. Became cities, and then you had, uh, cities became countries, and you know, things got monopolies, and things got bigger, and, and it just keeps going on like that, right? And there's rationalizations to cover it. Then you invent religion, right? Then you create poverty to plunder, to get more serotonin. See, you see how that works. So let's go back to the serotonin. What is that? So here's one quote about it. Okay, serotonin, the one-way mirror study. The one the one-way mirror study showed me how serotonin how serotonin motivates us to strive for social importance despite our best intentions. Researchers put an alpha monkey on one side of a one-way mirror and his subordinates 
on the other. The Alpha made his usual dominance gestures, but the others didn't respond with typical submission gestures because they couldn't see him. He got very agitated, being ignored, and kept trying to command their attention. His serotonin went down and his cortisol, the stress hormone, went up. You see? Okay, so now, this host let's, say, let's call this alpha monkey, let's call that the hostile provocative attachment style. Now, what is, now let's move on. So let's look at the hostile provocative attachment style. So we have a thread throughout this series on the hostile provocative attachment style. The main idea was that if the baby didn't get his symbiotic needs met, or if he was prematurely hatched out of a symbiotic orbit, he's going to be very enraged uh, to try to find someone else to fuse with him to meet his symbiotic needs met. So Berkler says he's trying to communicate that he didn't get his symbiotic needs met. That's why he's so demanding and aggressive and crazy making and uh, he's forceful and rude and uh, bullying because he's trying to get someone else to fuse with him because the mother didn't fuse with him. It's a secondary delusion. No one can do that. It's impossible. No one can travel back in a time machine and be that good breast mother and feed him and comfort him and soothe him. See, the, the, the breast is warm and safe, and, uh, but no one, no adult can offer that kind of thing. And, um, but the person with the hostile provocative style, they're angrily trying to find mother's security. They can't get it through anyone else. So Burglar says the positive intention is to communicate that they didn't get their symbiotic needs met. So you have to interpret their behavior as them not getting their symbiotic needs met. So let's clarify this. What do we mean by the symbiotic needs? Humans come out of the womb too early. Let's say that could be a tie into farming. One person said long ago humans came out a little bit later and they could walk when they when they came out of the womb, they could walk already. Uh, now maybe some uh, big question mark, I don't know about that, but let's 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 just accept the fact that humans do come out of the womb too early. They're helpless. Babies need what's called an extended womb. Okay? So the mother has to treat the baby like he's still in the womb. The mother has to hold the baby, meet the baby's needs exactly on time and be in, attuned to allow the baby to still think he's still in the womb. What if the baby doesn't get that? That leads to the hostile provocative attachment style. Now that, those, those first few weeks and months, that's called the stage of symbiosis. The baby doesn't know where he ends and his mother begins, right? He's fused there. So let's, let's, let's follow up on our thread on the symbiotic uh, issue here. So this uh, next quote is a rather lengthy one, but I'll do it in parts. But I think it's good. It, it really builds on this issue of the symbiosis. Okay. So now we understand the hostile provocative attachment style. Um, because they're looking for the serotonin that comes from the safety. Remember, safety leads to serotonin. The hostile provocative attachment style, they're still looking for good mother to get the safety. And they're all stressed out. And people with hostile provocative attachment style, um, you know, sometimes you can see that they're maybe very stressed out. Uh, speaking about... <laughs> I'm going to have another look here. Okay, so let's um, add some clarity to this uh, issue of the symbiotic needs. Okay, one, one important uh, thing to keep in mind with this next quote coming up is that the theory is that in the womb, the baby thinks it's all about him. He has a need, it gets met automatically. So we theorize by inference that he might think that he's a little god. We, we fantasize. If the baby were to have thoughts about his experience, we imagine it's as if he were to think he were some kind of god. He has a need, and 
it all gets met because he has no concept of him being separate from his mother. He's just in this blissful state, oceanic blissful oneness all around him. He's very happy apparently. Now in the extended womb, that's meant to continue. Now he makes a gesture, he makes a sound, his mother's attuned and it gets met. So he thinks he's like a little god. That's called the stage of uh, infantile megalomania, omnipotent thinking, and so on. Now this gets resolved by the age of three. But if there's trauma there and he's stuck there, the person feels very entitled. He thinks it's all about him. You see, up to the age of 15, during the practicing subphase of the separation individuation process, the child is, is experimenting. He's practicing to separate, leaving his mother. But he still thinks the world is his oyster. He's still fused there in his internal object relations world. The image of the self and the image of the other are still fused. So he thinks it's still all about him. He's all powerful. See, the mother was the giantess, and he's her. And he's he has infantile megalomania. He's special. He thinks he's a god, and he thinks his mother is omnipotent. There's a bigger god, and, he, and he's fused there. You see how. That's the narcissistic pattern. That's the hostile provocative attachment style. They feel very entitled. Uh, they don't care about others. You see, it's all about them. So they're still that. You see, they're, if, if they have those patterns, they're trying to communicate that they didn't get their symbiotic needs met. Either they were prematurely ejected out, or they didn't get it at all, or, uh, or they're frozen there. Something went wrong. So let's, let's look at this issue of the symbiotic um, stage here. Okay, so let's begin. So TQ1265. Uh, okay, it's, it's a big topic, so I need to take a breath myself here. All right. Okay, in the absence of properly developed ego functions of his own, the child's mother functions vicariously in his behalf. The infant, in turn, behaves as, as though he exercised direct control over his mother. So the theory is, the mother is being active, the mother's doing the giving, but the baby thinks he commanded it and, it, and it got met. You see? Hold on a sec. I think we have the geese. Hopefully you can start to see them. I think they're gonna... I'm not sure if you could see them, but there were some geese that just flew across the side there. Now you're not gonna see it, but there is a seal there. Let's see. I just saw a seal over there. I don't think you can see it, but there's a seal way down there. So, let, so let's keep this in mind. The mother's doing, she's omnipotent, she's the giantess, she's feeding the baby and all that. But the baby thinks he's creating it. So that's magical thinking. He has a thought, he makes a gesture, he just needs to get mad. He has a, like a magic wand. He has this in, in his thoughts, he has this invisible magic wand that he gets his needs met. Kind of thing. Children like to play with toy magic wands and, and all that, right? Uh, okay, let's move on. Okay, parent-child symbiosis. In this state of affairs, the boundaries between the child's and the mother's ego are virtually non-existent. Okay, the baby doesn't know where he ends and his mother begins. The mother-child, that's a dual, uh, like a dual unit, right? Two and the one, right? Okay, this is a unit made up of two partners in which one partner, the mother, wields all the actual power while, okay, the child seems to indulge in the fantasy or delusion of exercising unlimited control over her. This is, this is called the fallacy of magic omnipotence. 
The infant's implicit belief in magic omnipotence amounts to... Oh, hold on. Oh. Oh, what a pity. I hope you caught just a glimpse of it. Like a goose just flew across there. Oh, what a pity. Okay. <laughs> Um, see a child might if, 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 see a child might say okay geese I have the thought that you're going to make an appearance on the count of three one two three see he might exercise that, that fantasy or something like that now Edmund Burglar says that when people go to the casino or something they're reactivating that old omnipotence of thought Come on, lucky dice, uh, roll me a lucky seven or whatever it is, right? Um, see, they're reactivating that. They're they're um, nostalgic for that magical time. It felt it was a happy time for the baby to have everything met for him. You see, that's another thread in this series. Uh, the work of Edmund Burglar, by the way. Okay. Okay, the infant's implicit belief in magic omnipotence amounts to the denial of a gap existing between him and his parents. Now there's a remnant of this, a remnant, regarding a remnant of this, some may tend to bridge the gap, thus to recapture their, their lost unity with the universe at large. The virtual absence of a healthy symbiotic tie between mother and child. You see, people may want to try to regain that symbiosis. So that's what religion is for. They say, oh, okay, everybody, you didn't get your symbiotic needs met. Well, come in here, let's fantasize this great, uh, wonderful being, and let's be one with this great, omnipotent power. So let's recreate the symbiosis. You see? So, um, we had a quote earlier about religion. Religion wants to promote the continued use of childhood defense mechanisms. Okay, so fusion is a defense mechanism. If you didn't get your symbiotic needs met, you want to fuse and stay there, right? Okay, disturbed symbiosis has received a great deal of attention in the psychoanalytic uh, literature and has been considered responsible for virtually all types of complications in both ch children and adults. Okay, so that's the example we're giving here. Disturbed symbiotic needs, the disturbance can lead to all of these personality issues, disorders of the self. So one of them is the hostile provocative attachment style, you see. A symbiotic bond may develop, may develop between persons tied together by what some in religion have called cognatio spiritualitis. Levi Brawl described the same tendency as mystic participation. So some people in religion might say, oh, I had this spiritual experience. And, okay, so that was the fantasy of this fusion. They, re, they recaptured in their minds the fusion experience with the mother, the baby mother experience. Religion wants to give you that, to keep you hooked in it, to promote the prejudiced personality, to promote the poverty, the plunder and all that, right? Okay, her transcendence had all the hallmarks of her original symbiotic relationship with the father. Okay, now sometimes it could be a good mother god or a good father god, right? Okay, and uh, oh, the oh, okay. So she's talking about a client she had here. She um, sometimes uh, the person yearns for the father to help them break the symbiotic, to free them from the frightening, from the negative symbiosis with the mother. The child might look to the father for a positive symbiosis. You see, so this is a client here was looking for the father to have this positive symbiosis because they're not getting a positive symbiosis from the mother the, the, the child is stuck in a negative symbiosis with the mother so sometimes we look for the father for that 
Okay, the client says, quote, um, so the client uh, says to the therapist, you know, therapist, uh, I will never leave you. You know, I don't know who I am. You know, without my parents, I didn't know who I was. And so first there was my mother and I fused with her. And I felt like, uh, you know, it was just us against the world kind of thing. We lived in an igloo, you know. Uh, then when the mother passed away, I fused with the father. And now he's gone. Now it's you, therapist. The therapist says, okay, the disillusion, the disillusion of her symbiotic, of her symbiotic transference neurosis became the overriding concern for the treatment. She was helped to realize that she had spent her life in a hopeless search for identity through symbiotic fusion with a male alter ego. Okay, the early postpartum phase. The mother's, okay, the mother's uh, and the neonate's boundaries have not been delineated. Their respective egos or selves are merged into one. Okay, so now back to the mother. The mother feeds the baby when he's hungry. The mother gives the baby warmth when the baby is cold. The mother lifts his covers when the baby is warm. She diapers him when, she is, when the baby is wet. She monitors his physical and social environment on his behalf. She is the, um, the omnipotent, omniscient, bountiful, mother figure okay the theory is that the baby in turn partakes in her purported omnipotence okay mother or mother's breast or the breast mother as well as the universe at large are there at his beck and call indeed from his point of view it is he who exercises virtual control over his mother's behavior he signals his signals of distress, his whimpers or his cries, his kicking and so on, send the mother scurrying to his aid, to his aid his, and comfort. This is what Ferenzi has called uh, the omnipotence of movements. Okay, bottom line here, symbiosis has been described as extra uterine gestation. Okay, that's the, that's the extended womb here. So there's the key point. The stage of symbiosis is the extended womb. It's the extra uterine gestate state. You see, he's still, he's still in gestate. That's a, that's another egg. So we have the biological egg, the womb, the physical uterus. Now we have this extended extra egg gestation stage. That's the extended womb. The baby needs this extra egg. Okay, the physical uterus is the first egg. He's born, he's hatched out, metaphorically. It just takes a minute. He needs, now he's in this second egg. Okay, this second egg is needed for the psychological birth. Now, if the person doesn't get their egg, this symbiotic extended womb egg needs met, okay, if they're prematurely hatched or something goes wrong there, okay, that's a problem. They're going to end up with the hostile, provocative attachment style. Now they're going to be stressed out, okay? And from that, that's there. So there's the prejudiced personality, intergenerational trauma. You see? So I'm trying to link it all. To, I'm trying to be balanced here. We're trying to balance the psychology side and the sociological side to understand prejudice. So, um... um May, may I ask that people read through this quote here, uh, TQ 1265, and, uh, you know, give it some thought. I feel like I've achieved a little bit of uh, advan uh, a little bit of clarity this time on, um, I don't know if I got through, but in my mind, I feel like I, I think I feel a little, just a little bit more clear on the speculation of how it all links together. I, um between the uh, with, with the serotonin and if uh, and then, um, if the person is stressed from it. Oh, hold on a sec. Art Seagull. 
Okay, uh, so that's more on the so, so that so so far we've done um, uh, a follow up to TQ twelve forty five about uh, what happened uh, with agriculture. Did the birth of agriculture change how we raise the children? Lloyd Demas has this thing called psychohistory. I can hear a seagull. No, that's just a seagull. Okay. Uh, Lloyd Demas has this thing called psychohistory. He says if you want if you want to understand history, just look at how children are being raised. And um, now she's saying long ago they were raised properly. Then things went awry fifteen thousand years ago. So one theory is around fifteen thousand years ago that was the birth of agriculture. Then the child rearing went awry, and that led to. Uh, the stress of the needing to get more serotonin, then then there's the greed, and, and, and then the plunder, and then the pillage. So we went from global village to global pillage. Then you need religion to facilitate that. Then you create poverty, right? Half the people on the planet apparently live on two dollars a day or something like that. Thirty thousand people are dying every day because of this extreme poverty and malnutrition because of because of the greed and the plunder. Because the serotonin is too high, you see, it's something went askew here. That's the theory. We're drinking too much juice, not enough spinach, in other words, right? <laughs> so we got to wean ourselves uh, back to whole foods, I guess. Um, okay, I'm just rambling here. Okay, let's 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 move on. Let's move on. I'll see if I can follow up on this on these two uh, topics. Let's shift a little shift in gears here. Okay, TQ 1266. Okay, oxytocin is usually complicated by calling it the love hormone. Love often gets defined in idealized ways. Okay, transference love. Childlike expectations get reinforced. Okay, repetition compulsion of the transference love. R reality keeps failing to live, up, to live up to these expectations. People miss out on the oxytocin they're seeking. So there's a very good uh, book called um, Habits of a Happy Brain. Uh, that book was originally called Meet Your Happy Chemicals by Loretta Brunning. Very good book. So she talks about oxytocin as well, as being one of the happy chemicals. See, dopamine is one, you're excited, that's one happy chemical. Serotonin, you feel safe, that's another happy chemical. Called. Another one is oxytocin. Um, now, in the, in the transference love, um, you're projecting the past uh, unmet need for mother's love onto someone in the present and trying to get the love that you didn't get from the parent, it's frustrating, so you don't get oxytocin, you're stressed out, you see. Now in the I'm okay, you're okay, then you can get the oxytocin uh, from, from the natural love. So I think she was just clarifying, um, if you're caught in the repetition compulsion, in other words, there's a difference between love, the I'm okay, you're okay, and the transference love, those other three mindsets, that's all we're saying. So if you move to the I'm okay, you're okay, you can get the oxytocin. Uh, here's a, something from a sitcom here. Uh, in, in the sitcom, uh, I'm reminded of it. There was this thing about uh, the men, the battle of the sexes. Uh, there was an episode about the battle between men and women. And uh, the men, they, they thought that men were superior and all this. So in the conclusion, uh, uh, a contract was written up and it was handed to the men and the men were ordered to sign it so here's the contract okay so the, so the man was uh, reading uh, the agreement out loud or the contract out loud it said quote being a man and hence not of sound mind I must accept women as people, not broncos, and treat them accordingly. 
Sign it. Okay. <laughs> so the woman said, sign it to the guy. <laughs> so I thought I'd include that one in there. Okay, so in other words, women are people. Um, they're not self-objects. Right? So that's transference love. If the guy thinks the woman is there to meet the needs that they didn't get from their mother, they're parentifying, they're objectifying, they're not, they're not accepting her for who she is uh, as a person in her own right. They're just using her to meet the needs that she, the person didn't get when they were a child. Or if, if the man has the narcissistic pattern, they want to put down the partner. To stay loyal to their mother in the mind because they are the mother in the mind. I'll just leave it at that. So, this issue of uh, transference love reminded me of um, the excitement of, uh, see, the excitement of transference love or, or this all this romantic love is the hope for fusion. Oh, hold on a sec. See, a lot of this romantic love, this excitement, is this hope for fusion, this, the oneness, to, to recreate that, right? And a lot of romantic love songs are about that. So we have that, so I noticed, uh, I came across one from uh, Tina Turner Sings, a uh, cover song. She says, uh, in the transference love, when you think you're going to find the, the perfect one and fuse with them and be one, recreate that lost, blissful state of fusion. Uh, she says here, oh wow, you know, in the romantic love, your, your mind is not your own, your body sweats, your body shakes, you can't eat, you can't sleep, there's no doubt you're in too deep. Uh, you think you're immune to this stuff. Well, it's, well the close, it's closer to the truth. You know you're going to have to face it, you might as well face it, okay? Your love is transference. You're addicted to love. You're addicted to transference love. So it's like an, so this transference love, it's like an addiction.